Good evening. Welcome to the Pequot Library. I'm Stephanie Coakley, director. And on behalf of us all here, I'm just delighted to see a few of you come out this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm delighted to welcome this evening our very special Meet the Author presenter. But before I introduce our honored, honored guest, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to Kate Cacciatore with Sotheby's Realty for supporting tonight's snacks and drinks, and Tom Lowler with M Communications for the audiovisual support that you see tonight. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize the hard work of our dedicated volunteer Meet the Author committee members who helped organize tonight's great program, as well as the Owens family for first introducing us to Amor. Amor's first novel, Rules of Civility, was a New York Times bestseller and named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the best books of 2011. Tonight, we'll enjoy a special glimpse into his second novel, A Gentleman in Moscow which was on the New York Times bestseller list for over 40 weeks in hardcover and was named one of the best books in 2016 by the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the San Francisco Chronicle, and NPR. Both novels have been translated into over 15 languages, having worked as an investment professional for over 20 years, Amor now devotes himself full-time to writing in Manhattan with his wife Maggie and their two children. He graduated from Yale College and received an MA in English from Stanford University. Now, as a slight aside, Last week, this time, I had the opportunity to attend a program organized by the Quick Center at Fairfield University, and perhaps some of you were there, with former Ambassador Susan Rice. I hear a yes. Now, our library friend that evening, Dr. Philip Eliasoff, added to his introduction of Dr. Rice three fun facts. Do you remember that? One of those fun facts about Dr. Rice, of course, was that her blue eyeliner, very signature for her, was Estee Lauder. <laughs> so inspired by our friend Dr. Eliasoff, I thought I would do that tonight with Amor. So three fun facts about tonight's presenter. One, when he was a boy, he tossed a message in a bottle into the Atlantic Ocean. It was later found by Harrison Salisbury, a managing editor of the New York Times. <laughs> they started a correspondence. Number two fun fact. When he was 12 years old, he worked for a newspaper on the vineyard and he wrote about a fictitious male character that he imagined, a socialite male character. Thirdly, Amor, and this is my favorite, is a huge fan of the rock band Led Zeppelin. <laughs> right on, Amor. We are incredibly honored to host him for the second visit to Southport. Please join me in extending a warm Pequot Library welcome to Amor Tolls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I should let you know there are two seats here in the front. Anybody who wants them? Um, before we get started. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for having me back to the Pequot Library. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be here. Um, as I think many of you know, my relatively new novel, The Gentleman in Moscow, has a rather odd premise in that it opens at a Bolshevik tribunal 
in the Kremlin in 1922, where a 30-year-old aristocrat is being interviewed. And in the course of this brief interview, it becomes clear that the Count wrote a poem as a young man that was very popular with the revolutionary generation. So he has some friends in the upper ranks of the party, as it were. But on the other hand, it also becomes clear that he's an unrepentant aristocrat. So as something of a compromise, the tribunal decides that the Count can go back to the hotel where he's been staying, and if he ever comes out of the hotel again, he will be shot. With the snap of a gavel, he's marched out of the Kremlin, across Red Square, and through the doors of the historic Metropole Hotel, and that's where he spends the next 32 years. And that's where I ask you to spend 32 years with him. Now, where did this odd premise come from? I began writing fiction as a kid. I wrote it in high school, I wrote it in college, I wrote it in graduate school. Um, but when I was 25 and I moved to New York City, I joined a friend of mine who had started an investment firm, and 21 years later, we were still working side by side. Now, ultimately, in my capacity as a spokesperson for the firm, I would spend a week in any given year in Los Angeles, a week in Chicago, a week in London. And one year, when I was arriving at my hotel in Geneva for the eighth year in a row, as I came into the hotel, I recognized some of the people who were lingering in the lobby from the year before. It was as if they had never left. And I, I thought to myself, uh, you know, this is a nice hotel, but can you imagine if you actually had to live in it? And on the elevator on the way upstairs, I thought, you know, actually that's a kind of an interesting idea for a book. A guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. Now, in the elevator, I'm sorry, in my, in my hotel room, I then took out the hotel stationery and I began sketching the outline for this story. Now, right off the bat, I knew that if I was going to take my protagonist and trap him in a hotel for 30 years, he shouldn't be there by preference. He should be there by force. And that made me think of Russia for some reason. A <laughs> little intellectual, little imaginative leap there. But as soon as I thought of Russia, I knew I wanted to set my story in the Metropole Hotel. I had visited the Metropole when I was in Moscow in 1998. I hadn't stayed there, but the hotel is quite famous architecturally. Uh, the uh, giant uh, restaurant on the ground floor, for instance, has a huge hand-painted glass ceiling. So I had gone to admire that. So I knew something about the hotel. And uh, what it really comes down to, the reason I wanted to set my story down there, is really comes down to two things. And the first thing, of course, is location. Here we have a map of central Moscow. Um, now, in the center of this map is a little green triangle. And that green triangle is the great stone fortress, 1,000 years old, the Kremlin, where the Tsars lived and ruled Russia for hundreds of years until Peter the Great moved the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Now, just to the right of that triangle is an empty white space. That's Red Square, which is just a great paved square with an ancient cathedral on either end. Now, if you went out the top of Red Square and took a right, in about a block and a half, you'd end up in the part of the city that's shown in this little inset map in the lower right-hand corner, Theater Square. Theater Square, at the center of Theater Square, are fountains and plantings, and around it are five majestic 19th century buildings, all of which are important in the history of Moscow. In the lower left-hand corner is a building that was known as the Palace of the Unions before the Revolution. It was, ba sorry, the Palace of the Nobility before the uh, Revolution. It was basically the private club for the nobility. It's where they would gather uh, to celebrate holidays, weddings, um, uh, anniversaries, that sort of thing. Um, it was after the Revolution, it was renamed the Palace of the Unions. And it's where Lenin's body was first held in state. Uh, so that the citizens of Moscow could come pay their respects when he died before he was embalmed and moved to Red Square uh, in Lenin's tomb. It's also where the famous show trials were held in the 1930s. At the top of the square, you have the Bolshoi, where the ballet performed then and where it still performs today. In the upper right-hand corner, you have the most expensive department store in Moscow before the revolution and after the revolution too. Next, you have the Mali Theater, which is one of the two most important dramatic theaters in Russia. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, you have the Metropole itself. 
So as I said, I, I knew from having seen it that the hotel was situated uh, very centrally from a geographic standpoint, but also in terms of the history of the city. But of course, my primary interest in the it was in the hotel itself. Now, everything you see in this picture is the Metropole Hotel. It's about the size of a city block with hundreds of rooms. Um, this picture was taken not long after the hotel opened in 1905. When it opened in 1905, it was the best hotel in Moscow. It was the best hotel in Russia. Uh, made with the finest materials. It had imported marble in the lobby, imported crystal in the chandeliers throughout the building, French furniture in the bedrooms. It was the first hotel in Russia to have hot water in the bedrooms. The first hotel in Russia to have telephones in the bedrooms. So from its opening, it was the height of elegance uh, in Russia. Now, having said that, that it was unique in the country of Russia, it was far from unique in the West. Because the period from, let's say, 1890 to 1910, this was basically the golden age of the Grand Hotel. Uh, this is when the fancy hotels of large scale were being opened in every major city in Europe, as well as every major city in the United States, and along the Mediterranean coast and along the Florida coast. This is when the Waldorf Astoria really gets going in New York. This is when the Palace opens in San Francisco, when the Breakers opens in Palm Beach. And what the grand hotels in the United States and Europe tended to have in common is they were all about the size of a city block. They were all made with the finest materials. But in addition, they would have had a card room, a billiard room, a library, a great palm court where tea would be served in the afternoon, multiple ballrooms. And on the ground floor, there would have been shops around the periphery that you could enter from the lobby or from the street outside. Now, of course, to some degree, the Grand Hotels were being designed to serve the great new wealth that rose up out of the 19th century, um, the, to serve the Vanderbilts and their ilk, who were on their grand European tours and had very high expectations of where they would stay from one city to the next. But to some degree, the Grand Hotels were being built to do something that hotels had really not been built to do before, and that was to become an extension of their cities. The best way I can put this for you would be to say that if you went to the Metropole in the decade that it first opened, on a Saturday night, more than half the people that you saw in the lobby would have been Muscovites, not travelers. It would have been local Russians on their way to meet friends in the coffee house or to dine in the fine restaurant, which is the best in the city, or to dance to one of the multiple orchestras that was playing throughout the building. So from its opening, the Metropole was very much at the center of the social fabric of uh, Moscow, visited on a weekly basis by the nobility, by the intelligentsia, and by the upper bourgeoisie. Now, having said that the Metropole was very much like the other grand hotels in Europe, a distinguishing characteristic of the Metropole is that 12 years after it opened, it found itself in the middle of a proletarian revolution. And uh, it was very much in the middle of things. Um, as revolutionary activity was heating up in Russia in 1917, uh, a lot of it was centered in St. Petersburg because that's where the Tsar was, holed up in the Winter Palace, the Hermitage. But a great deal of revolutionary activity was occurring in Moscow as well at the same time. Um, and so as a result, at a certain point, the soldiers who were permanently stationed at the Kremlin ended up taking over a part of the Metropole, um, having determined that given its scale and location, it was the perfect bastion from which to defend the weakest flank of the Kremlin. And what they did is they put snipers in these corner windows that you see just left of cent center, looking out over Theater Square just in case anything should happen. Now in response to this, quite predictably, the Bolsheviks ended up building barricades right across the middle of Theater Square, and they stood behind the barricades with their arms uh, and their weapons, uh, and you ended up in sort of a Mexican standoff. Now in October 1917, uh, the revolutionary activity finally boils over in St. Petersburg, and the revolutionaries storm the Winter Palace, seizing the Tsar and his family. And suddenly the revolutionaries are in control of the capital. News of this reaches Moscow 24 hours later. And when it does, the Bolsheviks who are in Theater Square decide enough is enough, and they bombard the Metropole Hotel with everything they've got, 
breaking every single window in the hotel. Now, they successfully drive the soldiers back out through the Metropole, across Red Square, out of the Kremlin, and now the revolutionaries are in control of Moscow as well. We actually have a very interesting first-hand account of these events by an American, uh, John Reed, the great American journalist whom Warren Beatty immortalized in the movie Reds, um, was a classic Greenwich Village lefty. He loved revolutionary activity. And when he sensed that there might be a revolution in Russia, he left New York, sailed across the Atlantic, took a train to Russia, and he arrived in St. Petersburg just in time to follow the revolutionary soldiers into the Winter Palace. Um, now, when he came back out, he decided, I, I got to go to Moscow and see what's happening. So he boards an overnight train filled with soldiers. And he arrives in Ma Moscow shortly after the battle for Theater Square. And the first thing he does is he goes to the Metropole Hotel, because it's the only hotel he knows by reputation. And when he arrives, he goes right to the front desk and asks them if, where they have, if they have a room for him for the night. And in this great sort of 19th century grand hotel unflappable fashion, the desk captain replies, we do have a room, provided that the gentleman doesn't mind a little fresh air. <laughs> um, now at this point, the revolutionaries are in control of Moscow and St. Petersburg. But this does not represent the end of hostilities in Russia. This represents the beginning of a five-year civil war. Eight foreign countries send soldiers into Russia with their own agendas. The whites, the soldiers who are loyal to the Tsar, are continuing to roam the countryside in small battalions, uh, seeking out the Red Army wherever they can find them in the hopes of turning back the tide of history. The revolutionaries are not a single force. They are multiple factions who have been kind of working in, con in concert together, but also kind of trying to elbow each other for control of the situation. Now, pretty early on, the Bolsheviks are the faction who control Moscow and St. Petersburg. And of course, uh, they are led by the father of the revolution and the leader of the new Russia, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Now, uh, in this famous iconic photograph, I like to think of this as uh, Lenin's uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic pose, <laughs> leaning there out over the, the bow of his podium. This is Theater Square. Um, right behind uh, Lenin is the Mali Theater that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And the little sliver of a building you can see on the far right, that's the Metropole Hotel. Um, because the Theater Square is exactly where you would want to go uh, at the time if you wanted to gather a very large group and you had a very important speech to deliver. Um, what Lenin is doing here is he's speaking to factory workers, and he's trying to convince them to join the Red Army. This is 1920, so it's right in the middle of the Civil War, um, and the great fear the Bolsheviks had at this point was that a Western power would take advantage of the chaos of the Civil War to launch a full-scale invasion into Russia. So they were constantly recruiting new soldiers to go out and protect the Western frontier. Now, this picture is actually very famous for another reason. And that is uh, that while Lenin was you know, the founder, the father of the revolution, the leader of the new Russian government, his number two during the revolution and in the new government, of course, was his old comrade and friend, Leon Trotsky. And as usual, Trotsky is right here beside Lenin. Um, but now you, you needn't bother looking for him. Um, here he is. Does that work? There he is, right there, with the mustache and the captain's hat, just to the right of the podium. Now, uh, obviously, these pictures are taken just seconds apart. Um, Trotsky's not in the, uh, the, higher, the upper picture. This is not because he's excused himself to go to the washroom or anything. What's happened here is that while Trotsky was one of the first leaders of the new Russian government, he was also really the first communist to fall out of favor. And pretty soon after the revolution, he was pushed out of the Politburo. And then he was kicked out of the Communist Party. Then he was sent into exile. And he was eventually assassinated in Mexico City by Russian agents. And when that happened, the Bolsheviks went back and airbrushed him out of all the photographs <laughs> because they didn't want Lenin to have to share his great moments of history with his old comrade who had fallen from grace. Um, now, by 1922, Suffice it to say that the Bolsheviks are in control of the whole situation. 
They have successfully sealed the border, they've quashed the rebellion of the whites, and they've consolidated the factions of revolutionaries through in, uh, persuasion or intimidation or force. And they're in control of the whole show. And the first thing they do when they're fully in charge is they move the capital of Russia from St. Petersburg back to Moscow. Now this poses a significant problem for the Bolsheviks because Moscow did not have the infrastructure to support a modern government. You couldn't, couldn't use the Kremlin for that purpose. It was just an old stone building that had not served as a seat of government for hundreds of years. Um, so what they did is they seized the three best hotels in the city. The National, the Savoy, and the Metropole. Uh, the Metropole is renamed the second house of the Soviets. They kick out all the guests, and they sweep aside the luxuries, and they put many of the leaders of the new government in the suites on the second floor. Because what you want to keep in mind is that the leaders of the Revo Russian Revolution, for the most part, were not Muscovites, and many of them weren't even Russian. So they literally needed a place to stay. So they're put in the suites, but all the other rooms in the hotel are empty too. And they're used to house all manner of governmental agencies, everything that you could imagine, ma imagine to run a 20th century government. Um, and the, meanwhile, the uh, ballrooms are emptied, and they're used for, to have uh, large-scale speeches and votes. The fine dining room is empty, and it's filled with cots, so they can keep a standing battalion of soldiers in the building at all times, just in case. The first constitution of the new Russia is written in suite 217 of the Metropole under lock and key. And ultimately, the USSR is ratified as a nation across the street at the Bolshoi, uh, Bolshoi Ballet. Um, now, at this point, the Metropole is basically the single largest bureaucratic building in the new Russia. And that should have represented it the end of its life as a grand hotel. But an interesting thing happens over the course of 1922. And that is that the major Western European powers recognize the Bolsheviks as the legitimate government in Russia. Now it takes the United States more than a decade to come around to this point of view. But pretty early on, the major Western European powers come to that notion because keep in mind that for, they've been throwing off kings and emperors for about 150 years at that point, replacing them with quasi-democratic governments. So from the standpoint of England and France and uh, you know, Italy, it was about time that the Russians had gotten rid of the Tsar, and from their standpoint, the Bolsheviks represented the will of the people, and so they recognized them. Now, what this means was is that by the end of 1922, ambassadors start showing up in Moscow from the major Western European nations. Trade representatives show up. Corporate executives come from the biggest corporations in Europe and the United States, eager to establish ties with the new government uh, so that they can uh, do business as uh, the new uh, government uh, starts moving in that direction. And pretty quickly, the Bolsheviks realize that if they allow these sophisticated visitors from the West to come to Moscow and they put them up in crummy proletarian hotels, they ran the risk that the visitors would go back to London and Paris and New York with the news that the revolution was failing. So, they kicked all the party guys out of the Metropole Hotel. <laughs> and they began restoring it to its pre-war glamour. Um, a uniformed doorman is put back out in front of the hotel. Bellhops are back in the lobby. Champagne and caviar is served in the dining room. And the old orchestra is reassembled and begins playing American jazz on a nightly basis. <laughs> now, initially, the restored glamour and liberty inside the walls of the Metropole is reserved for foreigners. An ordinance is passed in the city of Moscow which forbids any Russian citizen from going into a foreign designated restaurant or hotel of which uh, the Metropole is basically example number one. So initially, it's just foreigners. But the citizens of Moscow end up reclaiming the metropole over the course of time. And this occurs in two waves. The first wave is that the leaders of the Russian government, of the Communist Party, start hanging out at the metropole. They decide food's pretty good, the liquor's pretty good, the music's nice, 
So they're hanging out there on a nightly basis, dining with their protégés, uh, with their comrades, with their mistresses, um, on a regular basis. Now, I think that if you asked most Americans what percentage of the Russian population in the 1930s and 40s and leading up into the Cold War in the 50s, what percentage of the Russian population were communists, most Americans would say 95%, you know, three quarters, certainly more than half. In reality, only 10% of the Russian population were members of the Communist Party. Now, this is not because the other 90% did not want to be members of the Communist Party. This is because the other 90% were not allowed to be members of the Communist Party. At the time of the First World War, before the Revolution, uh, membership in the Communist Party was basically a badge of ideological honor. If you were a member in the party, it's because you could quote your Marx and Engels, you had uh, organized trade unions, or tried to, you had printed pamphlets in basements, and you'd probably done some time. And this is what has earned you your place in the party. But in the aftermath of the revolution, pretty quickly, membership in the Communist Party became a gateway to privilege. Um, in those years, if you remember the Communist Party, you had access to special apartment buildings with larger apartments that you would not have to share with other families. If you remember the party, uh, you had access to special grocery stores where not only was there bread and milk on a daily basis, there were delicacies. Um, if you remember the party, your children were given better opportunities. You tended to be treated better by the judicial system. So without a doubt, <clears throat> if you were a member of the Communist Party, uh, it was a huge advantage to you and your family through most of the Soviet era. And so membership was doled out very selectively to those individuals who had paid their dues and proven their loyalty to the powers that be. So suffice to say that this group is hanging out in the metropole despite the prohibition because basically they can do whatever they want. Now the second wave is a much bigger wave. And what brings this about is a financial crisis. So what I want you to remember is that at the time of the First World War, Russia was the most backward of all the Western European great nations. Um, at the time, 95% of the population was illiterate. 85% of the Russian population at that point were peasants who uh, would plow with wooden plows and oxen on other people's land, much in the fashion that their great-grandparents had done as serfs, which is basically the Russian form of indentured slavery. Uh, there was very little industry. So Russia was way behind England, America, Italy, Austria. And when the Bolsheviks gained control, one of the first things they wanted to do was to vault over a half a century of failed investment and rapidly modernize the country to bring it into industrial parity with the other great nations of the West. And this is what the five-year plans were all about. Now the challenge that the Bolsheviks faced at the time was that there was not, uh, Russia did not have the equipment or the expertise to modernize. Luckily, the great Western nations, including the United States, were perfectly happy to sell their equipment and expertise to the communists. It's just that they didn't want to do so uh, in exchange for the new Russian currency. They didn't want to do so in exchange for an IOU. What they wanted was hard currency for these goods. And what that meant was the Swiss franc, the British pound, the US dollar, or gold. Now, initially, the Bolsheviks had a significant warehouse of hard currency, which they had seized from the nobility, uh, but they began to run out over the course of the five-year plans, threatening the modernization of the country. Now, at that point, the good news was that there was still a significant amount of hard currency in Russia. It's just that it was under the mattresses of the civilians. The population in Russia had figured out pretty early on, uh, they didn't trust the new Russian currency, which was experiencing incredible inflation, and they had figured out that they could use foreign currency on the black market to buy essentials for their family. So they were hoarding it strategically. So the Bolsheviks came up with this ingenious compromise. They said, okay, we're gonna reopen the foreign designated hotels and restaurants to the citizens of Moscow. 
provided that when you dine at the Metropole, you pay your bill in foreign currency. <laughs> and through this compromise, the Bolsheviks rake in the foreign currency they need to complete the modernization of Russia, and the citizens of Moscow once again reclaim the glamour and the liberty with inside the walls of the hotel. Now, just in case you think I'm making this up, <laughs> because I am not above that, by the way, <laughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to read a brief passage from the memoir of Eugene Lyons. Now, Eugene Lyons was the United Press International's Moscow correspondent in the late 20s and the early 30s. Um, and he spent a lot of time at the Metropole because the bar at the Metropole was the watering hole for all the American and British journalists from the time of the revolution right up into the Cold War. So they all talk about it in their memoirs at pretty much a great length. And now what Lyons is going to describe here is sort of a glimpse inside the hotel uh, in the early 30s. And I want you to keep in your mind that this is a few years after the Ukrainian famine, a time when millions died in Russia, a time of great shortages. Um, and it's just a few years before the great purges start to ramp up. So in the middle of what is a very challenging decade for the uh, Russian citizenry, this is what's happening inside the hotel. The Metropole was the new social center for the bourgeois colony. Its main restaurant was a Russian peasant's dream of capitalist splendors, immense candelabra, oversized lights, heavy furniture, a jazz band of symphony orchestra proportions. The chief pride of the restaurant, its ultra bourgeois touch, was a great circular pool where lights and rather proletarian looking fishes played. On grand occasions, the chef in cap and apron emerged from his sanctum with a net over his shoulder and captured a fish to cook for special customers bearing foreign currencies. The dancing couples rotated around the pool, and sometimes an unsteady customer joined the fishes to the great delight of the assembled crowd. Actually, here we go. So there, there's the dining room that Lyons is describing. Um, given my angle in this picture, you're looking at about 60% of the room. Um, and there's the giant hand-painted glass ceiling that I mentioned earlier. Uh, above that are two more glass ceilings that are fully translucent so that natural light can go from the roof of the hotel all the way down to the ground floor where uh, the restaurant uh, is located. Um, these are the giant lights that Lyons describes. There's the fountain where the chef would catch fish for special customers. In the back you can see the bandstand. Now the only thing different uh, the, of a period photograph is that there would have been about two, three, four times as many tables with everybody crowded in there, elbow to elbow, having a grand old time. Now, what I particularly love about the Lion's Passage is that it could easily have come from a memoir of someone in F. Scott Fitzgerald's circle talking about what was going on at the Plaza Hotel in the 20s. It is crazy that this is what was going on inside the Metropole Hotel across the street from the Kremlin, around the corner from the headquarters of the secret police, at the height of the Stalinist era. And this, of course, is, is why I chose to set my story in the hotel, for this paradox. Um, now, for those who haven't read the book, most of what I've just said isn't in the book. It's not in the book. <laughs> the book is not a work of history. It's not a Wikipedia entry. It's a novel. And so at the center of it are individuals, appropriately and most importantly is the figure of the Count, who at the opening of the novel and at the age of 30 has lost his family, his, all of his possessions, his social standing of course, but in addition he's watching as everything that he values in Russian life is being systematically uprooted by the new regime. Um, this is how he begins his internment in the hotel. And over the course of his 30 years there, he must establish new relationships. He must find new causes for happiness, however small, and ultimately he must find a new sense of purpose. And this is really what the novel is about. Um, now having said all that, 
I would be happy to take any of your questions, and if you don't have any questions, I will ask them myself. <laughs> so, there you go. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a microphone if anybody would like it. So uh, what happened is that uh, when, when it came time to record the audiobook, Viking Penguin reached out to me and said, you know, we're lining up to do this now at this stage in the process. Um, do you have any feelings, instincts about what we should be looking for? And I said, yeah, you know, I think that what you're probably going to have to do is turn to uh, a British uh, performer with Shakespearean training, you know, to do a good job. And I, you know, my, my instinct was that uh, because um, is that the great thing about being Americans, me included, is that the, the British accent sounds sophisticated, you know? I mean, for all we know, that guy could be, you know, the son of a fisherman in Liverpool, but he sounds like an aristocrat to me. You know, there, it just seemed cumbersome to try to read the book in a Russian accent, which would, you know, sound kind of phony, uh, I think. It wouldn't sound right. I've got nothing wrong with Ohio, you know, but, it, you know, if anybody likes Fargo, having people like, you know, the Fargo accent read it wouldn't make sense, you know. So, so, uh, so yes, I sort of thought, let's, let's, let's take a look at a British, uh, and I wanted the Shakespearean training because uh, the, the tone of the language is very important to me. And that's a very important part of the, of the uh, Shakespearean training in, in, in England, is the articulation of sentences. And so, um, so they came back and they found three, gave me audio files of all three, and then you know, we narrowed in on Nicholas Guy Smith, who I think does a great job. Yes? I like the Where's that coming from? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I think that I think that all successful novels can be read as allegories to some degree. It's almost by definition, because if, if a novel is successful um, as a work of art, it should be relatively timeless. And uh, what that means by definition is that we can take the the narrative events, the individuals in it, uh, the themes of it, the poetry of it and transport it, you know, half a century forward, a half a century forward, and the readers at that time can take in those elements and draw meaningful conclusions about their own lives. So, so you know, in that sense, it almost is required. You know, uh, so Moby Dick, it is a great ocean yarn, but of course, it also can be taken as an allegory for many things, which is one of the reasons it survives. The Sound of the Fury by Faulkner, the same, Mrs. Dalloway, by Wolf, Virginia Woolf, the same, you know. So I, I don't, I certainly wouldn't take an issue with the notion of, of looking at allegorical aspects to the story. I would hope that, and, 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 and frankly, you know, the, the, the fact that the book has been as successful as it has in the United States in this day and age, I think is evidence that, that people can take this sort of strange situation in another time and place and find some uh, kind of meaning for themselves in it in today's America. And, and so, yeah, I think I, I, I welcome that reading. But I wouldn't get too specific about it, <laughs> right? I wouldn't say it's an allegory of this any more than I could give you in a sentence what Moby Dick is an allegory of. Yeah, like Thank you. <laughs> 
we, we have, oh, up, or they go ahead and somebody in the back, and then we have some people up here in the front later, but go ahead, please. How and where did you go about your research? How and where did I go about my research? Um, you know, the, the fact is, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't do really apply, the way I work is I don't pick a topic, research it, and then write it. What I do is I write about things I'm already fascinated in. So for those of you who've read Rules of Civility, it takes, you know, it's about the young woman of working class background in New York in 1938. Um, I have been a fan of the 20s and 30s since my youth. I'd seen the movies, I'd read the novels, I'd listened to the music, I'd studied the art movements. And so by the time I sat down to write that book, I had 30 years of familiarity with the era. And that's what I relied upon. That was the foundation I relied upon to invent my version of 1938 New York. And when I was done with the first draft, I began going back and doing some applied research to sharpen some details, um, to check some facts, that sort of thing. Um, it's the same thing with the Russian story. A gentleman in Moscow, I, my interest in Russian literature dates back to my late teens and early 20s, and then I got interested in the Russian avant-garde before the war, and then I got interested in the Soviet era. Um, and so when I sat down to write this book again, I had close to, to 30 years of cumulative familiarity with Russian culture, and that's what I used as the foundation to invent the story. And when I was done, I went back and did some applied work to sharpen some details and elements. And um, all, which all of this begs the question of why. You know, why would I do it that way? Why would I put off this, this, these elements of research to the end? And I, I think that to understand this fully, because I think it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate on this for a second, because I think it's, it's important, is, um, you know, an interesting irony of our times is that we as a generation have gotten to the point where we expect, or even really demand, more factual accuracy from our novelists than from our presidential candidates. <laughs> And that is crazy when you think about it. That is crazy. You know, so, uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, people, you know, uh, today, if an author gets, uh, you know, a, a street address wrong, he or she will get a thousand emails. You know, it happened around the corner. Oh, okay, it happened around the corner, you know. And I think what's interesting is that I, I think this is a very contemporary way to read serious narrative. For hundreds of years, readers of serious narrative would not have applied that particular fine-tooth comb to the reading process. You know, I think we can go all the way back, let's take a look for a second at Shakespeare, the height of English narrative right at the beginning, and, uh, you know, Henry V, for, as an example. Um, that play, you could read it today, you could go see it performed, you can watch the Kenneth Branagh film, which is in the original Shakespeare, and you will find that it's still exciting, it's still relevant, it's still compelling uh, to watch today or to read, and now, when Shakespeare wrote that play, he was not trying to add to the historical record of the Hundred Years' War or the Battle of Agincourt, the event which the play really centers around. Um, for Shakespeare, he's, re the, he's interested in the contours of history, sort of the rough sense of what was going on in the background. Because what really intrigues him is not the temperature on the battlefield or the number of dead in a given day or you know, who ran what battalion. He's interested in things like how does a 20-year-old man who is a drunkard, a gambler, a womanizer, at the age of 30 or whatever, become a king of great integrity and honor? How did that happen with Henry? Um, and once he's king, how does he convince his fellow countrymen to leave their homes, uh, knowing that half of them will never return, to go and fight for their country? And by the way, what does that mean, to fight for your country? What is this thing, England? You know, we scattered across, we never even see each other from one end of the country to the next. Uh, we, our accents are a little bit different, but yet there is something about England that we are willing to give our lives to defend from the French. You know, what is that all about, right? So these are the kinds of things that intrigue Shakespeare uh, and that, that drive the play. Now, the way his, if you look at his project, what he does is the settings aren't very elaborate in Shakespeare's plays. The durations are not very long. Many of the plays take place over a period of days. So what he's really focused on is creating three-dimensional figures, individual characters that have all of the, uh, the whims and impulses of the rest of us, all of the virtues and vices. 
and he's going to set them in motion. He's going to raise the stakes a little. And then ideally, through the manner in which they share their sentiments and their ideas, and through the poetry of Shakespeare's language, we get some glimpse of the human condition in a manner that is timeless and universal. This is the big project. And both my instincts and my experience tell me that too much applied research, too early, gets in the way of that. It clutters up the narrative, trying to earn its, its, you know, its chops uh, with the history books, and pushes back the central mission of the narrative project. So that's why I'm, well, that's what I think about that. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, we... Uh, we should move the microphone to the front, though, after this, please. Go ahead, yes. Go, no, go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no ma'am. Uh, oh, I see, we have somebody else. We have a fight here. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, and we'll bring the microphone here in a second, please, but go ahead. I'd like to know where you got the recipe, where we can get the recipe for the bullion base. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes, um, I do cook the bouillabaisse, which appears in the book. And you know what? It's kind of been assembled from a variety of ones. Um, it, it, and it's funny, you know, you get people get quite hot about these things. You know, I would never put X in a bouillabaisse, you know. I mean, certainly a bouillabaisse is a fish stew with a tomato base and saffron. Everybody agrees with that. But uh, there are types of bouillabaisse with a little bit of uh, the zest of an orange in it. And there are some with a, a little bit of anise or, uh, 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 you know, the licorice-flavored liqueur of some kind, just a tad. And so the, the one in the, in the book is, combines those elements. So if you search for bouillabaisse and put in orange zest and, you know, uh, and the other elements, you can, you can find some recipes. I don't remember where mine came from. I, I will tell you that the, the, the Latvian stew is a, um, you can, if you search Amor Toll's Latvian stew, you will find both that recipe and the, my, an essay I wrote about it, <laughs> which is what the, uh, the count orders on, in essence, Christmas Eve, or close to Christmas Eve, at the end of, uh, 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 you know, early in the book, as he's eyeing a young uh, date taking place to his right. Um, and so, yes, that's worth making for sure. You should definitely track down the Latvian stew. Uh, yes, so we have in the, in the front some, the, the, please, yes, go ahead. Thank you for your marvelous book. Um, there was a passage that I copied down okay. that I was reading that intrigued me. Yep. And I would love to have your comment on it. It appears on page 290. Uh, Russians and Americans have learned to brush the past aside instead of bowing before it. But where they have done so in service of their beloved individualism, we have done so in service of the common good. Yes. <laughs> Is that a question? You have a question? You, you want to know what, what, I, what I meant by that? Or what OSIP? <laughs> So the, the passage is, that's being read there is, is Osip is a figure in the book, for those who haven't read it, who is a, an executive in the state. Um, and he is a you know, classic Bolshevik executive in that he was a rough background, fought in the war, uh, you know, clearly from a, you know, a proletariat background, and has risen through the ranks and is a serious uh, Bolshevik leader um, or, or executive, a revolutionary. And uh, what he's saying on my behalf, I guess, <laughs> is, that, is that, yeah, you know, one of the interesting things about, the, about the, the state of Russia in the 20th century, you know, from the revolution, is that in a way it was closest, it shared many aspects with the United States, in that if you looked at, you know, France or Austria or Italy or Spain, they held on to many trappings of their old heritage, uh, you know, well into the 20th century. Um, uh, the pomp, the circumstance, the respect for certain things, uh, you know, whether it was the art or the old holdings or, you know, as colonies, etc. And, and Russia really, with the revolution, cast off everything from that, you know, from the royal era, from its grand 19th and 18th century history, where it was one of the great powers in Europe and had one of the most sophisticated cultures, just threw it all aside to build a whole new nation, right? And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, and, and obviously, there was a lot of very bad consequences from the way they went about it. And, but they also achieved many of the things they sought out to achieve on the other side of that. Um, so by way of example, on, the, on that side of the ledger, I mean, 
uh, we know many of the, the worst aspects of it uh, as Americans. Uh, but on the other side, uh, because, because we were all raised, educated in what went wrong in Russia and, and for many of us. But um, I mentioned earlier that 95% of the population was illiterate at the time of the First World War. That's true. Um, by 1930, well, they outlawed illiter illiteracy. They outlawed it and funded a massive literacy drive requiring that Russians of any age, including in your 80s, needed to learn how to read. And they populated it with students, sent them out all across the country. By 1930, even earlier than that, 95% of the country could read. Uh, now, you know, I mentioned that at the time of the First World War, that Russia was the most backward of all the Western European nations. Again, that's true. There was no industry there. Um, what you want to keep in mind is that as by the end of the Second World War, Russia was the most powerful industrial nation in the world other than one, us. They had surpassed everybody in Europe and Asia by a wide margin, putting guys on the moon, just like us, right? So there was this incredible uh, marching forward uh, of industrial progress, of a variety of things. And, and so, yes, what my, my, the point of Osip's passage is, is listen, you know, we're, we're, that's what we're about. We're going to cast off all this stuff of the 19th century, which basically entrapped uh, our people, kept us behind, and we're going to vault into the future towards a common good. And, and it, that was the goal. They didn't achieve it. But the, common, the goal of the, the original Russian um, constitution uh, guaranteed equal rights for women on the very first day. Um, it, it, you know, took religion off the table, making, you know, that is, you, you know, there was no priority of religion. So, so it was streaking, uh, seeking a common society. So from their standpoint, yes, they were doing this modernization for a common good where they see it in the United States being tied to uh, a pursuit of, uh, you know, pr uh, the, the love of the individual which I think is, is an accurate one. We are, we are a caring society in many ways. America, statistically, is, one, is the most charitable nation on earth. Um, but, but we have gotten where we are through this pride in, um, in individuals, in which I back you know, fully um, as a person. But yes, those are different approaches. Oh, Mike, go ahead, please. Yes, I have to say that most people here have read your first book and your second book. Do you have an idea for your next book? Sure. I mean, any book that I write is, is generally the product of an idea that I've been sitting on for a very long time. And, and what I will do is I'm an outliner. So uh, I will design the book I am writing over a period of years. By the time I sit down to write chapter one, I usually have a 50-page outline with every chapter, every event, every character in their background, every setting, all the thematic arcs and, and psychological arcs and sentimental arcs outlined uh, in place. Um, so, yes, I am, I am nearing the completion of the design phase for my next novel. I hope to start it, writing it in January, and it is about three 18-year-old boys on their way from Kansas to New York City in 1952, and that's all I will tell you about that. Is there significance to the fact that all the chapters have titles which only use A words? And the, an the answer is, um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I decided, early on I had this sort of the instinct, you know what, all the chapters are just going to be A words. And I really felt good about it, so I stuck with that. And, uh, and you know, I get, I get emails from people who make suggestions, because I, I, I don't know. And so, you know, somebody wrote me and said, um, I think you did it because, uh, you set, you channel all the chapters beginning with A because the book is about new beginnings. And I thought, that's a pretty good, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. And somebody, else, somebody else said, I think you did it because Alexander begins with A and Amor begins with A. And I'm like, that's good too. <laughs> so if you've got another one, you're welcome to send it to me. <laughs> the email, the contact page at amortolls.com comes right to me, so send in your ideas. So, oh, sorry, yeah, do we, because that was a short one, you're gonna give one more or no? All right, and then I'm going to tell a quick story after this, but go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I've really enjoyed your book. I have three quarters of the way through, so maybe the answer comes within the next quarter. But how did the child pay for everything? Did he have that many gold well, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Um, well, you know, he has, for, for much, well, I don't want to give things away for people who don't know the story. Um, you know, don't know the story. 
Um, so maybe I'll, 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 I'll pull aside on, on the end. But, but it's, I mean, the answer is kind of threaded through the book, I think. Um, but so I have time. Well, I, I should tell, I'm going to tell one story, and then uh, you've been very patient with your time. I appreciate it. Generous with your time. Um, I, as I think I hope comes across, the novel's an invention. The characters are an invention. The events are largely an invention, um, you know, within the contours of history, uh, uh, ideally. And, but inevitably, aspects of your personal life will percolate up through the imaginative process and when you're creating a book. And the most clear example of that, in the case of a gentleman in Moscow, is uh, the two young girls in the story. Um, for those of you who have not read it, early in the Count's internment at the age of 30, he meets a nine-year-old girl who's living in the hotel, and she kind of changes his view of what, could, what it could mean to be in the hotel. She thinks it's kind of cool to be living in the hotel and kind of sort of begins him on the, on the road to rethinking his situation, and, and they become friends. And much later in the story, in his 50s, he meets a five-year-old five girl who has very profound impact on his life. And so um, there's no question about it. The creation of these two girls, their personalities, the way they act, is influenced by the fact that uh, my daughter was five when I came up for the idea for this book, and she was nine when I finished writing it. And my, my daughter is really the one who, who showed me how shrewd a little girl can be. They, they, they are not to be underestimated in, in any way. And so, you know, to give you a flavor for that, you know, and you can sort of see it through the book, but, you know, on New Year's Day this year, my wife, my daughter, my son, we all went out to dinner. And my daughter at this point is 12. And uh, so I sit down and I say, hey, it's New Year's night. Why don't we go around the table and we all share what our New Year's resolutions are going to be? Uh, you know, that would be fun. And my daughter, without skipping a beat, says, Dad, don't you think you should be less focused on your resolutions and more focused on your bucket list? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a terrible thing to say. Yeah, exactly. So I, so I hit her with my cane because it's the only appropriate response to that comment. So, but, so when my daughter was five and my son was eight, uh, um, their favorite restaurant in New York City was this little, was this little Italian place nearby where we live called Paul and Jimmy's, which is a third generation Italian restaurant, very old school chicken parm and spaghetti and meatballs and salt and bocca, veal salt and bocca and, you know, classics. So my kids loved the food, but what they really loved about it was how they were treated by the staff. So when we would go to dinner there, uh, the, our children would run ahead of us on the street and they'd burst into the restaurant and the staff would say, oh, senor Tolls, oh, la principessa, come in, come in. <laughs> and when we got to the restaurant, the kids would be seated at our table looking like they own the place. So, so when my son was turning nine, we said, uh, hey, Stokely, you know, for your birthday, we can go to any restaurant in the city within reason. You know, what would you like to do? Assuming he'd say Paul and Jimmy's. And uh, he says, in this great wistful fashion, he says, uh, wouldn't it be great if we could go to Smith and Walensky's? I'm like, Smith, you know, for all, you know m most of you know, Smith and Walensky's is this old school steakhouse in the Upper East Side. And I'm like, you know, where does an eight-year-old boy learn about steakhouses, you know? Well, it turned out that the year that he turned nine was the year that they first put televisions in the back of taxi cabs, and Smith and Walensky's was the very first ad. So he had seen it like a hundred times. So I said, you know, hey, Stokely, if you want to go to Smith and Walensky's, we can do that for your birthday. And he says, you mean it's in New York? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, that's why it's on the cab, right? So, so on his birthday, we all get dressed up and we go uptown, Smith and Walensky's. And, and I, if, you, if any of you have been there, you know that the waiters at Smith and Walensky's are these big old guys who look like butchers. And, and in fact, they wear butchers' aprons. That's what the waiters wear. So we get seated in our banquet, and uh, the waiter comes over, a you know, big six-foot-tall guy in a butcher's apron, and he says, um, all right, welcome to Smith and Walensky's. Let's get down to business. Uh, what are you going to have tonight to drink, ma'am? A martini? Good choice. How about for you, sir? Another martini? Well done. Uh, how about for you, lad? Okay, a uh, Coca-Cola. It's on its way. And what about for the little baby? Oh. And the, the, the second he says this, he realizes he's made a terrible mistake <laughs> from the expression on my daughter's face. So after a moment of silence, 
My, my five-year-old daughter says to this six-foot-tall guy in a butcher's apron, she says, I am not a baby. <laughs> At the other restaurant, they call me La Principessa. <laughs> that was her then. That was back then. Yeah. Very tough. But thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I appreciate it so much. Thank you.